Just going to quickly run through a few verses in, in Matthew chapter 7, which we know is the Sermon on the Mount. And again, you know, we use it in that um, same class, possessing your vessel, but it's good. Even if you've heard it before, just allow the Word of God to just come in you and, and soak in you a little bit because there's a verse in here that could be misused in the context of this teaching, right? Don't cast your pearls before swine. We've all probably heard that verse. It doesn't mean the person that disagrees with you is a swine and that you're not supposed to give them the Bible. Because that would be really contrary, wouldn't it, to what everything we know about Jesus. So if it doesn't mean that, what does it mean? I'm going to just unpack it quickly for you so you have a, a relevant way to use this. It means that God is a relational God. Right in the Trinity, we see a relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? Why does he say, don't forsake the assembly together with other unbelievers? Because there's something powerful when we come together as a family. Why do we call each other brother and sister? Because in the early days of Christianity, they were leaving their family. They were being rejected. And this was literally like their new family. And we've gotten so far away from that. And we get to so fragile about things. But no, look, we're here for a reason. And the reason is to shift the culture. So in these few verses here, he's giving us a really important formula to help crack that code of how to talk to people you disagree with. Uh, it's a supernatural gift, okay? It doesn't come natural or easy to us. Judge not that you be not judged. Anybody here think you don't judge people? Good, no hands are going up for those of you uh, at home. So... If he's telling us not to do it and we know that it's an easy temptation to fall into, then we have to be intentional about this. It doesn't mean don't be discerning. We do have to be discerning. But that's different than judging because in the text here, the context of this word judging is think less of the person and devalue them. And like I said last week, don't ever say they can't change. They'll never change. That eliminates God from the picture. You can't eliminate God from the picture, so you can't say they'll never change. Because, right, how many stories have we heard of Muslims having Jesus appear to them in their bedroom at night, and they're getting saved? That was Rabbi Zacharias' story pretty much, right? So, look, you can't say they'll never change. They might be stubborn, but so was I. Don't judge them so that you won't be judged, because... With the judgment you judge, you will be judged. That's a reciprocity. So God get, was forgiving of your mistakes. Maybe we should be forgiving of each other's mistakes. Doesn't mean don't tell them the truth, but don't judge them. For with what judgment you judge, you'll be judged back. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eyes, but you don't consider the plank in your own eye? Now I know you all heard this, right? But this is a very present help verse in this time of trouble that we're in right now. All right? Look in the mirror before you look out the window. <laughs> that's from the book Good to Great. That's not my uh, original thought. But that's, that's what the author said. The best leaders look in the mirror to find out what's my ownership in this before they look out the window to blame everybody else for the problem. Right? That's our job. That's what Jesus is saying. You can't focus on the speck in your brother's eye until you look at your own things and your own issues here. And then he calls them hypocrites, right? How can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your own, your eye and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, I know that sounds a little theoretical, but here's the deal. You should be one of the best listeners anybody ever met in their life. Why? Because you're a Christian. And why then, as a Christian, you have Holy Spirit? And why then? Because you pray and you spend time in the hiding place of God's glory. And every person you look at, you look past the package, you look past the language that they're using and say, Lord, show me what you see when, when you look at this person. Give me a prophetic word for them. Give me a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge. Let me pray for something that they wouldn't expect I would even ask them to pray about. Right? That's all the tools in the toolbox. But if you don't go open the toolbox... And you just get loser, right? That's what they used to do uh, in high school kids. I don't know if they still do that anymore. When does Jesus do this? Aren't you glad? He didn't do it over you. Could he have? Yes. He didn't give up on me. So that's this tricky verse now. 
Don't give what's holy to the dogs or cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Now, I know that's a hard verse because it seems like there's only one way to look at it, but I would say the key is how you look at the word pearls, okay? Because a pearl would not be edible to a pig. Lest they turn and tear you to pieces. See, because you are edible to a pig. <laughs> So the pearls in the context that I believe this is saying is that you're trying to give somebody a sermon. You're trying to lecture somebody on how they're supposed to live because you think you're better than them. And that's a way of showing contempt for people. You didn't take the time to build a relationship and they're not able to hear what you're saying because they feel like you're lecturing them. And it's like the old uh, Charlie Brown. Remember that? The teacher in the front of the class. They'd shut you off. It's like, who the heck are you to try to lecture me? You don't even know me. You don't know anything about me. You never took the time to even learn anything about me. And you're coming here and giving me these lectures. So the, the, the way you start is by building a relationship. And that comes through prayer. And you say, Lord, I really have a burden for this person in the next cubicle or whoever it is. In my last office, it was the cleaning lady. You know, the people that were coming in after the office closed. There's a whole crew of them, and they most only ever spoke Spanish. Like, you think they're less important to God? No. Every person. You can't even put a price, right? So I, I'm going to skip the rest of the deeper part of that. I guess you could go deeper on it. But as long as you see this as pearls being the wrong language to the right person, don't do that. Don't lecture people, okay? You with me? I can't tell with these masks on, man. All right, thank you. You could use your voice. So what should I do? If I'm not supposed to lecture them, what should I do? Ask. That's called prayer. <laughs> Ask. What does God love the most? People. How does he want to get to those people? Through people. So the best chance they have of having a revival and getting delivered from drugs and all those cool verses in that song that we sang today, right? I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every addiction. Because they're from the pit of hell. And God has the power to break it. And we have the power to help people, but not if we're lecturing them. That's what he's saying. you got to build a relationship. Get to know them. Let them know that you really care about them before you try to give them advice. Because otherwise, it looks like you're just another notch. i got somebody to say the prayer today. I'm a great evangelist. No, sorry. It's way deeper than that. Ask, and it will be given to you. What will be given? A strategy of how to approach that person, in my example. <laughs> Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open. Just go to their desk and say, hey, you got time for a cup of coffee tomorrow? I heard you talking about football. I really like football. Well, I don't care. Whatever way the Lord shows you, say, sure. I'd like, just like to get to know you. What college did you go to? Whatever. I, you know, you, you're in your world. You figure that part out. God's a relational God. For everyone who asks, receive. So if you'll just ask the Lord... I know you want this person saved. Your word says you don't want one person to perish. How can I be used in that transaction? Go, go to my sister-in-law, Linda. She could write a book about witnessing the people on your job. It's amazing how many lives have been touched. Everywhere she goes, she leaves with more Christians there when she's leaving than when she got there. Isn't that amazing? What a gift. It's all because she practices. <laughs> she's really good at it because she uses those muscles all the time. What man is there among you for if his son asks for bread, we'll give him a stone, or if he asks for fish, we'll give him a serpent? I'm God, he's saying basically here. If you even know how to good give, give good gifts, and you're asking me of how to help somebody know me better, you don't think I'm going to tell you? Are you kidding me? And how many miracles we've heard. I, I was just watching one again, because this guy, Mike Hutchings, that's coming, uh, powerful deliverance ministry, and he was at Randy Clark's meeting, teaching, and during the prayer session, uh, there was a bunch of interns there we were, at, were at the Supernatural School of Ministry, and we have a man that attends our church that was the guy that went up for prayer, and there was an absolute miracle that happened, a complete healing from horrendous accident that he had. We should give the Lord a hand for this, okay? Complete healing. <laughs> Miraculous. All from a prophetic word that a student got that never met him before, didn't know him, didn't know anything about him. Because you don't even really have to know too much of the details of the thing they need prayer for. God knows already. You just act in the middle of your conduit. You allow him to pour himself through you. So it's all just ask. 
He's not going to give you a serpent. I, I already kind of quoted it. If you being evil already know how, good, how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father? Therefore, whatever you want men to do, why don't we stand? This is a good verse to end up. Whatever you want men to do to you, do to them. Man, really? Whatever you want men to do to you, do to them. That's the golden rule. Treat other people the way you want to be treated. I just think part of what we need to focus on right now, this, you know, I said win the war for your altar, right? Win the war for your altar. Is that we're going to need courage to press in and not just blow people off, but to really ask the Lord, what's the strategy, God? And wait until you get the strategy before you interact with them. Because it's really hard to treat other people the way you'd want to be treated if you were them. You know how you'd want to be treated as you, but he's asking us to go a little further than that. Put yourself in their place. How can you do that? Through Holy Spirit. Help me understand what they're going through. Help me understand how they're processing all this information. If we're not a force for good in America in 2021, if the church isn't leading the way, something's really wrong. There's so many tools in this book about healing relationships, right? And we gotta lead by example. 